Welcome to Crash Concepts, where the economy, energy, and the environment are explored. Up next, fresh ideas and insights into the factors that are driving the world and shaping your future. Presenting information you can't afford to live without, here's Chris Martinson. Welcome, everyone, to this Featured Voices podcast brought to you by PeakProsperity.com. I am your host, Chris Martinson, and it is July 23rd, 2019. The data is clear. The world is headed for trouble, and especially the natural world. Humans are overdoing it, and the ecological stresses are clearly mounting. And the data is equally clear. People are tired of hearing that, and they want to know what they can do. So how can we wean ourselves from a system of extraction and depletion? What steps can we take to be agents of positive change? Well, here's the good news. There are lots of things you can be doing. Mm, Heck, I'll go further. There are a lot of things you should be doing. Ooh, there I go straying into judgmental territory, but it's absolutely true. If you can do better, why wouldn't you at this day and age? Well, today's guest has made it his life's mission to dodge the blame game and land firmly on the solution side of the conversation. Paul Wheaton explores, experiments, implements, tests, re-implements, and then teaches and shares practical solutions to millions of people who both want to and are ready to be agents of positive change. Paul is a contemporary permaculture theorist, a master gardener, software engineer, and disciple of natural agriculturalist Sepp Holzer. He operates the websites richsoil.com and also permies.com. You can also find him on YouTube, where you can find videos on topics like mm, super efficient rocket mass heaters and maybe respectful chicken harvesting. Now, a lot of you have been asking to have Paul on the program, and here he is, Paul. Welcome to the program. Hi, Chris. I'm glad to be here. Always glad to infect brains with my gobbledygook. (laughs) Well, let's start big then. In your view, if humans stay on the current trajectory of prioritizing economic growth over ecological health and diversity, what lies at the end of that road? I don't know. <laughs> That's not honest. This chat. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Well, we're done here. <laughs> <laughs> I I think that it looks scary. Uh-huh. Uh, I'm I'm worried about a lot of things. I do think though that uh, <clears throat> when you start talking about uh, bad people being bad, that if you live in a city, you better really keep an eye on that, and you better you better hyper focus on what the politicians are doing because. One bad step, and you could find yourself dying of starvation. Uh, and it's like, so it's it's critically important to pay attention to that. But of course, if you are living the permaculture dream uh, out in a rural area, um, all that stuff really doesn't matter very much. I mean, it still matters, but it's like, it's kind of small and far away. You've got your own home that's paid for. Uh, you've got uh, a, a large garden. Uh, you go to town maybe only once a month um, because that, you know, there's a change of scenery maybe or something like that. But all those problems are very small and far away. So when we talk about like, what are the, you know, the, the big issues there are, there are a lot of extremely serious issues. I, I love the guy who said something to me about, because I kind of thought that whole thing about preparing for the zombie apocalypse was really silly. And he pointed out like, if you prepare for the zombie apocalypse, even though that's funny and silly, you're actually preparing for all of the other things that are yet to come. And and so it's a little bit more fun to prepare for the zombie apocalypse than, say, you know, uh, total currency drop or, um, or, or nuclear annihilation or something like that. Well, I'm absolutely agnostic as to the why somebody does something. So I had an experience a while back. I was planting fruit trees. I'm doing it because I'm worried about food security and I actually like uh, higher nutrition. And so I'm planting fruit trees. Right. So this is really in my in my uh, uh, becoming resilient arc. And a neighbor, old guy comes over and he, he's asking what I'm up to. And I tell him I'm planting fruit trees reminds him he happened to really like the apple blossoms when he's growing up. So he planted some up for because different reasons. It didn't matter at all to me that he shared my particular concerns, but it did matter matter that he was taking action true true and it's for a lot of the things that (laughs) hey i wrote a book (laughs) but but the thing is is the solution to nearly all of our problems is plant more trees (laughs) it's it's like amazing how that just kind of fixes everything if you just plant more trees it solves everything and then of course take a lot of the trees that we have now that are undesirable trees and like rather than setting them on fire or something like that 
hey, here's a thought. Let's let's build some things out of them, or make a large stack, or let's bury it. Um, let's 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 do something useful with this that keeps that carbon around. But now, where are you on carbon footprint? Oh, not that good. If you look at the amount of trash that goes out at the end of my driveway, or um, you know that I still drive around, I got a hybrid. But you know, honestly, I'm a I'm a United States citizen. So, uh, in the scheme of the world, I'm way at the f- bad end of the of the scale. And there's not a lot I can do about it, to be honest, because of the culture I live in. Some of it's structural. I, I, oh, dude, I want to make this so much easier. You're going to be so happy when we're oh, done good. here. <laughs> Let's do this. You already said something. Like you, you planted an apple tree, right? Mm-hmm. Now, now, first of all, you're, you're saying like, okay, well, oh, I'm only driving a hybrid. I'm not driving a Tesla. I think I heard you say that. <laughs> I'm not. I'm but, not driving a bike around. You know, for my daily oh, needs. Or a bike. Okay, sure, sure. But but I think a big part of my book is is about how do you have a more luxuriant life while simultaneously addressing these things rather directly. So first, let's let's get the real numbers out. So uh, your carbon footprint. The average carbon footprint of an American adult is 30 tons per year. And that's their personal footprint that they're doing directly and their indirect footprint, which includes all of industry. So it's it's because we got to take ownership for that. Now, you know, what we can do is we can go out there and be angry at those guys. Hey, you guys are screwing everything up, you know, and rah, just wag your fist and write to people and volunteer for dysfunctional organizations and there's all kinds of things you can do but if we just take ownership of it and like okay we're at 30 tons that's what we got to beat that's what we got to correct if you switch to bicycle only or if you switch from an uh, a, a standard american gas guzzling car and i shouldn't say gas guzzling because the average american car to a tesla that reduces your carbon footprint by two tons per year. Hmm. Now, are you in a cold climate or a warm climate? Uh, Massachusetts, kind of cold. Kind of cold. Okay. So now, what kind of heat do you have in your home right now? Well, a good question. We have, uh, it's all oil furnace at this point in time, being New England residual, and I put solar hot water on this past spring, uh, okay. which reduces my oil footprint by about a third. Okay. All right. All right. Um, I, I want to talk to you about solar hot water in a minute and talk about Legionella bacteria, but let's set that aside. That's another discussion for another day, perhaps. Um, but the, but the big thing is, is that, um, let me, let me pretend for a moment. Let me start with saying if a person has, uh, electric heat, which hardly anybody does, about a third of the United States uses electric heat. But, uh, uh, if you switch from electric heat to, a rocket mass heater, which you mm-hmm. mentioned at the beginning of the show, you will reduce your carbon footprint by, I believe it's 27 tons. Whoa, that's a good place to start. So if you switch from, if you switch from your current vehicle to a Tesla, that reduces your carbon footprint by two tons. So, uh, but if you, if you parked a car completely and just didn't go anywhere, that would reduce your carbon footprint by four tons. So basically, switching from electric heat to a rocket mass heater would reduce your carbon footprint as much as parking seven cars or switching, I guess, 14 cars over from gasoline vehicles over to Teslas. Um, So uh, I and and I'm I'm realizing now that I'm saying Tesla like it's the Kleenex of electric cars, I guess, (laughs) which which probably is electric vehicle. So, uh, which, by the way, they are lovely. Have you ever been in an electric vehicle? I have. Uh, I've been in a, a couple of types of Teslas a long time ago, back when they were very quiet. They were very thin. nice. I, I hardly wish to encourage everybody to explore this path. It's it's definitely a a move in the right direction, but I can do so much more. And it, and it's like because a Tesla's kind of, uh, electric vehicle is kind of expensive, and um and and I want to I want to paint a picture of a life. That's so luxuriant and so wonderful that you just end up not using your vehicle very often. And so even if it's a vehicle that doesn't get particularly great mileage, you end up using it so rarely that 
uh, you're actually making less of a carbon footprint than if you switch to a Tesla and continue living the old lifestyle. Well, this is good. Uh, and Paul, what I'm really interested in are, are things that can be done at scale by average people. Because look, half of households, median households in the United States can't scrape together 500 bucks. So uh, $60,000 Tesla is probably out of reach. So so as, as much as I'm a fan of electrifying things, I'd actually rather electrify subways, trains, things like that first, maybe buses um, as a choice. But hey, it's not up to me always. But what can the average person do? You've mentioned, we've both mentioned this thing called a rocket mass heater. Let's decode that. I bet not everybody knows what those words mean in that combination. So this is going to be um, something that uses wood. Now, of course, a lot of people um, are going to shun wood heat because of the smoke. But this is something where uh, the design of it uses the smoke as a fuel. And so what comes out of the exhaust is generally uh, steam and CO2. And so it's kind of like it's it's very clean. The the total pollution might be similar to burning a candle, um, and it is vented outside. And so, um, but uh, you generally, if you were to compare it to a conventional wood stove, you would heat your home with one tenth of the wood, and it would probably put out like one one hundredth to one thousandth of the smoke. Uh, you can heat your home. I I live in Montana, probably a little colder than where you mm -hmm. are. Um, I heated my home uh, a couple of years ago. We measured it very carefully. It's a three-bedroom house. Uh, I heated it, uh, and it's it's not a particularly well-insulated house. It's a it's a let's just call it a standard issue house uh, with 0 0.60 cords of wood. And uh, so, to give you an idea, if you had a box that was uh, four feet cubed, so four feet by four feet by four feet. And um, I just threw the, the, the bits of wood that fell off of trees in my yard into this box through the summer. I could use that box if it's heaping. That would be the amount that I would use to heat my home through the winter. And this is not like, oh, I'm, I'm heating it to just something barely tolerable by polar bears or something like that. This is, this is keeping it around on an average of 69 degrees. So we would get it up to like 72 during the day. And um, and two days later, it would be down to 66. And so then we would build another fire. Uh, so let's talk about so this rocket uh, mass heater. So there's mass involved and there's an efficient mm -hmm. combustion process because you said we're basically there's no smoke. So we're, we're burning everything that can be burned. But how yeah. is it so much more efficient than a standard wood stove? Oh, that is that is like the best possible question, because when you go to the wood stove store, it's like, ooh, look at these wood stoves. They say they're 75% efficient. Mm -hmm. Well, when they say they're 75% efficient, the government allows them a 16% to add on for what goes up the chimney. So they're actually only 59% efficient. And then on top of that, 59% efficient was the best they could get in the lab that did the testing. So they would have performed like a dozen different tests using kiln-dried wood and special conditions to get that very good, good number. But the thing is, is when you bring it home, you're probably operating it at 30% efficiency or less. And at night, the way most people throw big logs on the fire and turn the dampers down, they're probably operating it at 5% or less efficiency, thus giving us a lot of room for expansion. A rocket mass heater generally runs at 93% efficient, but even more than that, while the exhaust of a conventional wood stove, the smoke that goes out the chimney, is going to be, it's legally required to be 350 to 600 degrees. That's a lot of heat going outside. Whereas a rocket mass heater, the exhaust temperature is somewhere between 70 and 140 degrees. We're keeping a lot more heat indoors. So we burn more efficiently and we keep a lot more heat indoors and we have a mass. And the mass makes it so that because with a conventional wood stove, a lot of people have to get up in the middle of the night to stoke the fire. So they're sleeping, and then they wake up at 2 a.m. because it's gotten so cold. And if they don't get up, the pipes in their house will freeze. So uh, they have to do that. Whereas with a rocket mass heater, the mass was warmed up, and the mass slowly radiates heat back out. And so usually you go to bed, and at 72, and you wake up, and at 69. So it, it keeps putting heat out throughout the day. Now, we could get it to be even more efficient if the house is you know, far more insulated or there's passive solar or if you've got a structure that happens to use some annualized thermal inertia. Uh, I'm going to get to that topic in just a second. But first, let's talk about the complete deal breaker, zoning. Uh, 
permits, uh, local people in inspection boards who have no clue what rocket mass and heater mean when we put those three words together. What have oh. you found there? Uh, uh, good news and better news. So um, the good news is is that uh, uh, I think I've, I I think I was visiting with Erica Wisner recently, and seventy different boards now recognize rocket mass heaters. Um, and I've heard from at least three different insurance companies that recognize rocket mass heaters. So there's there's progress in that space. Great. I've also heard of people that um, uh, are doing it without permission. And and uh, more power to those people for having that kind of courage. Mm -hmm. um, where I live, that's not a problem. There are a few places throughout the United States where it's not an issue. You can do whatever the hell you want. Uh, you know, at least so far. I mean, that could change, right? Uh, and uh, the better news is that um, <clears throat> uh, we're seeing a lot of people, there's being so much more demand that the uh, regulators are now catching up to the demand. So we're seeing hundreds of thousands. We might be to the point now where it's beyond a million people that have uh, put in a rocket mass heater. I mean, you think about it, like, Right now, you've got a listener that's living in a highly regulated space, and um, uh, they're and and they're just thinking like, okay, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go ahead and and, uh, and do this uh, because I can save two thousand dollars a year on my heat costs, um, and it's like just the idea of saving the money is is worthwhile to them, so they make the leap, and so uh, it's possible that that could end up being some kind of problems down the road, but generally, it's better to ask forgiveness than permission. Um, I think what I've heard stories of is when people build it and then the regulators come, um, the regulators are actually quite excited about it for a, a bunch of different reasons. And the number one reason why uh, insurance companies and regulators are excited about it is because um, here is a form of heat that has um, almost zero chance of causing a The number one reason it's a problem why insurance companies hate it, I mean, Regulators hate it because of the uh, uh, or hate wood burning things because of the smoke, and the the uh, insurance companies hate uh, wood burning things because of the creosote. Mm -hmm. It'll it'll start a um, a chimney fire, and so like the uh, uh, you talk to somebody who works for a rural fire department, and the number of times they're called out for a chimney fire is immense. And so basically, one of the things the rocket mass heater is doing is domesticating the chimney fire. We try to make a chimney fire with every burn and hmm. use that creosote effectively as fuel to heat your home rather than burning your house down in a chimney fire. Well, and the other number one cause of fires around here is uh, people putting ashes out in, in a burnable paper bag or a plastic trash can on the on the porch. That happens all the time. What are what's the uh, coal ash situation with a rocket mass heater? You're going to have extremely little coal because the fire burned extremely hot and fast. So usually you're going to get your coals from a fire where you turn the dampers down. So you put a, generally a large log, oftentimes a wet log on the fire to have that all night burn in a conventional wood stove. And they turn the dampers down. But with a rocket mass heater, you, there's no dampers to turn down. You, you can't have a slow burn. In fact, you don't want a slow burn. I mean, it, a lot of times what they're doing is they're doing that like late at night, like it's 10 o'clock at night and they're getting ready to go to bed. <clears throat> they're going to put a couple big slimy logs on the fire and turn the dampers down to get through the night with a bit of a burn. But with a rocket mass heater, you had a fire this morning, and that fire went out hours ago, and the house is still very warm. You're not running a fire at night, generally. I mean, you could if you wanted to, but most people don't. Yeah, and, uh, you know, I, I'm really sensitive to the idea of uh, uh, not wanting more wood stoves going because here's an experience. A place I lived a few houses ago was in a little valley and there was some gentleman, I don't know, 10 houses away, had one of those outdoor wood furnaces things that he would, I, I think he was burning tires. I don't know what he was doing. But at any rate, when this guy would fire up on a, on a cold morning, he could fill the whole valley with smoke, right? It was amazing. Right. Yeah, we've seen lots of places like that. Whenever you live rurally, there's always somebody who's got... It's like, are they burning brush? I mean, that's a lot of smoke. No, it's coming out of their chimney. And, or, or you're right. It's one of those things that's outside, and it's just, it's just polluting the whole county. And it's like, yeah, those are not cool. 
Now, here's a here's the thing to keep in mind, and I don't know about where you are, but where I am, we get forest fires, wildfires. Mm-hmm. And um, and so then the the wood gets burned up in an inefficient way. And then when it's not getting burned up, then people are out there, mostly the Forest Service, and they're trying to burn wood intentionally so it doesn't have – so there's less chance of this area having a forest fire later, and they're burning it very inefficiently. And so it's kind of like the, the great thing is, is like, let's go grab that wood before they burn it. And we'll use it for a variety of things, including heating our homes, instead of creating all the smoke, which is just putting it up into the atmosphere. Yeah, so let's imagine uh, this is a perfect situation for me. I'm sitting here, I'm in Massachusetts. I've got a place in the living room where I could put a wood stove, but you know, I'm sitting over, a, there's a large basement underneath all that. What ta- you know, If I just have standard 2x10, 16 on center uh, joists, would I be able to put a, a, a mass heater there on that floor, or would I have to bolster that somehow? How much mass is involved? I think that there's going to you should expect to have like something on the order of ten tons, and so yeah, you're going to need to bolster that somehow. Mm-hmm. Um, I know that uh, uh, the house I'm in right now um, uh, needed to have uh, uh, support underneath the house for the for the mass of the rocket mass heater. That's what we did. Um, but when you're talking about you have a basement, um, that that can come that can be managed in a lot of different ways. Uh, but it's up to you which way you want to go about doing it. Do you want to put a an extra pole there, or do you want to, you know, uh, sister uh, your joists, or what do you want to do? There's there's many ways to go about that. All right. So um, let's imagine somebody's uh, very interested in this. For, uh, uh, do people sell these things, or are they all kind of like home built? How does how does one go about acquiring one? Uh, there are some people that sell the cores, but I haven't seen any of them that I would endorse. Gotcha. Um, most of it is going to be self-built at this time. I I have heard of some people that will come and build them for you, but the big the 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 big resources at this time is going to be uh, uh, Ernie and Erica have the book out, uh, the Builder's Guide, the Rocket Mass Heater Builder's Guide, mm-hmm. um, and so then there's that. I also have uh, an eight DVD set that kind of helps to to paint a picture. In fact, um, the the main um, uh, example in the builder's guide is the same rocket mass heater that is in my single DVD building a Cobb style rocket mass heater. Um, so that's a little, it's a little cheap, quick thing there. Well, that sounds excellent. And at the end of this program, we'll get to all the ways people can access all of these materials, including that DVD set. Um, so carbon is one thing people could worry about. It sounds like uh, taking care of the heating is one of the largest single things you could do for a household. But now let's imagine um, uh, city dwellers, I don't know what to do about if they have no access to land, but for everybody else, whether they live rural or suburban, what are some of the next things they might begin to do if they're concerned with, say, I don't know, biodiversity or eating more healthily? Oh, and <clears throat> okay. Now, so the minute you say that, I'm thinking gardening. Yeah. Did you limit me based on how much space they have? How much space do they have? I, well, I'm I'm really interested in what a half acre solution might look like because I think that would apply uh-huh. to the most people. But if we wanted to then say what you would do with five acres, that would be a separate conversation. That's true. That's true. So um, let's start. Let's start with a half acre. I mean, basically, throughout this book. We talk. Uh, we focus most on uh, carbon footprint, petroleum footprint, and toxic footprint. And that book, um, by the way, is building a better world in your backyard. Yes, instead of being angry at bad guys. Yes, I love that part. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, go ahead, be angry at bad guys. Okay, all you want, thanks. But let's provide the other part too. All right, it's both. And, it's... and and a big part of the book started with, um, you know, Al Gore came out with that movie, An Inconvenient Truth. Mm-hmm. And then a year later, Derek Jensen wrote a book called As the World Burns, 50 Simple Things You Can Do to Stay in Denial. And, and basically, uh, one of the things he points out in that book is to talk about, like, if you did everything Al Gore suggests, you, you know, like if everybody, everybody in the United States does everything Al Gore suggests, we have cut our carbon footprint by 22%, but we need to cut it at least 75% if we're going to stop global warming. And uh, the next thing is, is like, okay, we've, 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 everybody has done everything, so it cuts at 22%, but we add 2% in every year. So in 11 years, it's a wash. Mm-hmm. And, and so my philosophy is, is that the recipe that Al Gore provided was really weak. 
And of course, Derek Jensen, he goes off in a whole other direction. <laughs> it gets a little darker, like, Derek, but yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so that's not my style. And so I'm, I want to come up with a much better recipe. And so, you know, I want to make it so that if 10% of the people did it, that we can have a 200% solution. And so that's what the book is about. Let's, let's have much better solutions. Now, it turns out that uh, when it comes to petroleum footprint, more than half of your footprint if you include industry, is in your food. And um, uh, uh, with food, if you look at carbon footprint, it's about 35%. Um, and so it's kind of like, all right. And then, when, of course, with toxicity, it's about 70% is in your food. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like, so really, uh, taking care of your own food is a big, big, big part of it. And um, I do have a chapter in the book that's uh, uh, how to grow twice as much food with one tenth of the effort, and so um, a half an acre will be great. Let's let's start there. That's you know, so. I think that the average urban lot is about a quarter of an acre, and um, I have a I have a YouTube video I took years ago where it really focused on if you're not bringing in inputs, which there's a lot of people that bring in inputs, and there's a lot of problems with that, and that's a whole another book right there on why you don't want to bring in inputs. But if you're not bringing in inputs, how much food can you grow? And so basically one of the uh, conclusions was there was a family, uh, a couple living in Portland, Oregon, and they had been doing permaculture for like five years. And um, they felt that if they could go five more years, and they were intensively working this, this you know, uh, standard urban lot, um, that by the end of 10 years of super duper heavy duty effort that they would be able to grow enough food on that plot to feed one small adult. <laughs> That's without any further inputs. Now, of course, if you're going to bring all kinds of stuff in, there's more you can do, but you don't want to do that because of reasons, especially if we're talking about health, which I believe you mentioned. So uh, uh, I want to explore a space of like, what makes for good food? If you if you're going to grow carrots in a field and you're going to go eat organic carrots, then it's kind of like, how good are those? I mean, they look the right color, they look the right shape, they they look fine, they taste fine, but I kind of feel like, have you ever tasted a a carrot that wasn't grown in a monocrop? Much more flavor, much crisper, much much more delicious, much more flavorful. And I mean, sometimes you say, oh, it has more flavor. <laughs> and that's not necessarily a good thing. <laughs> it's like, man, this tastes like dirt. <laughs> <laughs> but well, I, it is earthy, you know. It's kind yeah, of... <laughs> a little hard to, hard to digest. You're a little hard. To, it's, not, it's not exactly palatable. Um, but palatable, I think, is a huge part of what we're looking for. Now, I, I kind of feel like not only do we want to have rich soil, and 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 that's going to be such a key component. But and I think you, I would I would suspect that you probably already know a lot about that. But I want to go a step further. I want to go rich soil, and then let's talk about polycultures. So every plant produces an exudate, and so if we're talking about a carrot, we can refer to it as you know not exactly, but kind of sort of carrot poop. <laughs> and then every plant has stuff that it wants, you know water, air, and stuff from the soil. And so it turns out that if you put, if you create a polyculture, and then uh, uh, there's, there's been tests that have been done where it's like they would uh, put a radioactive substance into one plant, it'll show up 30 feet away within a few days because the, that plant uh, was put, had this stuff put into it and then it exuded something. The next plant over took up that exudate and then it processed it and took the things it liked, and then it had an exudate, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all the way until 30 feet away, some other plant has been able to pull this stuff up. So what does a carrot taste like that's growing in rich soil and is surrounded by 40 different species of different plants? And it is taking in what's in the rich soil plus the exudate of these 40 different species. 
What does that carrot taste like? Yeah, no, that's fascinating. You know, we've had um, uh, other guests on our program, people we know well, Toby Hemingway, obviously before he passed, and then Paul and Elizabeth Kaiser of Singing Frogs Farm out in Sebastopol, and, and they are soil farmers first and foremost. Brilliant, just really dedicated, very smart people. And when I first visited their farm, the first thing I noticed was at least 30 species of birds and uh, that they had rows of, of interplanted things. But the thing that got me as a gardener of 30 years who was doing it all wrong for 29 of them uh, was that their broccoli was just sitting there and there weren't cabbage loopers all over it. And I didn't get that. And they had explained that they don't they don't do they don't just do organic. They don't start any sprays, even safer soap or something for aphids, because they say as soon as you knock out the aphids, those are the the prey species. What happens? Well, you lose the predators and who comes back first and all that. So they had this really complex, integrated thing, but it was about the soil. And I'm a very long way of introing this, though. But in order to run their CSA operation, they had to bring inputs in twice. You said, don't bring inputs in. What's your caution there? All right. I, th- I think that the number one caution is going to be um, uh, persistent herbicides. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, if anybody has read Ruth Stout, amazing book, wonderful techniques, so, um, so much to learn from. That's really the path to go uh, in 1980. And uh, uh, now here we are, damn near 40 years later. And uh, any, and so what, what Ruth Stout did was is that rather than tilling her garden and tilling in manures like all the other people did in her neighborhood, she wouldn't just got hay and she laid the hay out on her uh, garden and then she just plopped seeds in between the bits of hay or underneath the hay or whatever and that was it. She didn't even irrigate and she had a magnificent garden. Can't do that today unless you are able to not only find organic hay, but make super duper sure it doesn't have any spray on it mm. because, uh, because of the persistent herbicide. So let's say you go out and you get a standard bale of hay and you do this. First of all, all your garden dies. And so it's all dead, except for the grasses, because these persistent herbicides are broadleaf herbicides. So grasses do fine. And, it's, and, and then the hay is off, oftentimes a grass hay. So what, was happen, what happened was is that the farmer sprayed the persistent herbicide. And it was, it was presented as, oh, it's so eco. Because you only spray once every five to ten years. You don't spray it three times a year like you do with the other herbicides. And so they're thinking like, ah, I'm eco. I'm doing the environmentally friendly thing. But the thing is, is that it passes. If a cow comes and eats that, it passes right through the cow. If you take that and you put it into a compost pile, it survives the composting process. Um, and so, which is why all commercial compost contains persistent herbicide, all of them. I, I can and confirm so you, this. I, I, I bought this beautiful stuff. It had biochar in it. It's made by this local firm, but they bring in a lot of inputs from wherever and, and then they compost it. I bought this stuff two years ago and I have spots where I spread it where seeds won't sprout two years later. Nothing. It yeah. looks, we call it the black death in our household, but there it is. It's, and I didn't know what was wrong, but I suspected an herbicide or something or some biocide. I don't know what's wrong still to this day, but it's probably a persistent herbicide. It has a half-life of 7 to 11 years, <clears throat> depending on which one was used. Um, uh, aminopyrrolid, clopyrrolid, um, uh, uh, tordon, there's, there's quite a few. And then the thing is, is that as soon as we ban one, they come up with another one. So it's kind of like um, it's, it's a mess, and it's very problematic, and it's in everything. So it's like – so there's, there's – I mean – and then the other thing is you're going to get commercial compost. Not only is it going to be laced with persistent herbicides, guaranteed. It's just a matter of like, is it so little that it's only going to stunt the growth of your plants? Or is it enough that it's going to kill everything? Um, but even, even more than that, it's like uh, uh, most of the compost that you get are some form of industrial waste. If you get the stuff that, has, uh, that comes from sewage treatment plants, that's going to contain a variety of heavy metals, pharmaceuticals, et cetera. But those, you know, the heavy metals are the big problem for that, but they still contain the persistent herbicides. But now they're getting to the point where where, uh, certain industries are discovering that they can put even more varieties of industrial waste into compost and get rid of it Mm. and sell it to suckers. And so I don't know how many times I have found myself, I don't know how this happens, like I'm presenting somewhere and then somebody shows up and they say, hey, I'm the scientist that did the test, and I'm here to say that it falls well within the government guidelines. And I said, fuck the government guidelines. The, the important thing is, would you put that on your garden 
and you eat it. Oh, well, no. <laughs> <laughs> what, drink this glass of Roundup? No, no. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> and so it's kind of like, no, it, it's got such in, insane levels of toxic gig. And um, when it comes to our sewage treatment plants, I've, I could probably go on about nine or ten hours about that and solutions in that space. But that's a that's probably uh, not what you want to talk about today. <laughs> no, but it's an important bookmark because it's it's really critical. But let's imagine that you do, you know, you've, you've got your half acre. I want to get back to this half acre. And let's say you want to put okay. a garden in and you know you have to build the soil up. What are you recommending here? Okay. Well, first of all, I'm a cold climate guy. And so in a warm climate, you're probably going to go with something a little bit different than what I'm about to recommend. But I'm going to say hugel culture. I'm sure this is not the first time you've heard the word. I've heard it, but let's explain it for everybody else. It is uh, soil on wood. And so if you stack it to be seven feet tall, uh, and you mulch it and you plant your garden in it and stuff like that, you've effectively doubled your growing space, right? Because it's now kind of a pyramid, pyramid. shape, yeah. right? Yep. Yeah. And so uh, what used to take up uh, seven feet uh, on the ground now has a one side that goes up seven feet and another side that goes up seven feet. You've doubled your growing space. But on top of that, let's pretend for a moment that uh, you don't get a whole lot of rain, in which case um, now this is something where you no longer need to irrigate. And as an added bonus, everything that grows on there is going to be far more delicious because most food that you get or that you grow in a garden tastes bland because people water it too much. <laughs> and so now we're going to have something that tastes far more delicious because it has not been irrigated, but it got all the water it needed from all of that hugel culture that's underneath it. When it's that big, then you'll have all kinds of logs and branches on the inside that are rotting. And as they rot, they create parking spaces for nutrients and water. So um, there's much, much more to this, but what I'm trying to say is if you've got a half an acre, I want you to grow hugel culture. I want you to do polyculture. I want you to have diversity. I want you to do all kinds of wacky things and grow lots and lots of food. And it might not be enough to feed your whole family, but I hope that it's something that's extremely simple to do and it might dramatically reduce your family's food bill. And with that food bill is attached a very significant carbon footprint and an even more significant petroleum footprint. And toxicity, um, too. And the toxicity. I mean, that's where most of your talk, that's your biggest toxicity vector. I don't know. Have you ever seen that uh, YouTube video of the little girl? And she looks like she's about eight. And uh, she's growing a sweet potato. And she talks about how her sweet potato never grew. She put it in there and it didn't grow. And... And she goes back to the grocer and she says, why didn't my sweet potato grow? I put the toothpicks in, I put the water there, you know, should work. And they said, oh, well, we found out that people didn't like to buy sweet potatoes where they had like little roots sticking out of them. So they've all been treated with budnip. And so uh, and since budnip is something that grows in the plant, it's systemic. You can't like wash it off. And so, uh, but, you know, what you got to do is get something that doesn't have the bud in it. So she went to the organic grocery and got it, and she managed to get a little tiny bit of green growing out of it. And then she talked to that grocer. Why isn't it bigger? Why is it so pathetic? Why is it? And he said, oh, oh, even organic has bud in it, just not as much. Because <laughs> our customers will tolerate a little bit of roots, but, they, you know, they still don't want a, something with a bunch of roots coming out of it. So then she went to like a local farmer and got one that hasn't been treated with budnip. And then, of course, it grew into this giant shrub like almost instantly. So what a magnificent example, even organic, because basically our organic systems today are conventional farming where uh, certain toxins have been replaced with more natural toxins. And so, uh, and then they're allowed to still use certain toxins that are not even natural, for example, budnip. And so it's like it's, then the, then the next thing is it comes a more political thing where it's like, well, it's not really organic, but we're going to give you the organic certification anyway, just this one time. And I know we've said just this one time the last 157 times, but I'm sure that we'll get it all straightened out soon. So it's kind of like, 
their or, organic at the grocery store is certainly better than non-organic, but still leaves a lot to be desired. There's a lot of room there. So when we talk about toxicity in our food, then um, the standard is weak. Yeah, and we did we did a, a piece a while back with a, a two pieces with a gentleman from Food Democracy Now, where they actually bothered to go out and test for Roundup. They were looking for glyphosate on on foods, and you know, spoiler alert, uh, they found it on organic brands. Right, um, it's still there. It's so pervasive, and and you know, there's like you said, the definitions are evolving. Like, oh no, we didn't use this as an herbicide. Oh, we used it as a desiccant that falls within the organic guidelines or something. I don't know what the story was. Right. <laughs> yeah, you, <laughs> you know. totally violated the standard. But we're going to let you go this one time. Well, yeah. uh, you know, so so this is something that that of course uh, I, I think is just you know a, a good friend of mine, uh, Jim Kunstler. He says that what we're doing is we're running rackets on ourselves, and, and food's a giant racket, of course, and 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 you know the food system itself is laced with all these things that are designed to metabolically upset us and capture us. And but at the same time, even if you're trying to eat organic, which is better, it's still just. It's just there's my trust is is broken irretrievably in this. So the idea that I can pick something that I've grown, at least I know what I've done, right? Uh, there's some control you know the on that. Story. Yeah, you know the truth. You yeah. know what's really going on, unless of course some fool two years ago brought in commercial compost and spread it on everything, and now he gives it the name of like. This is the spot where nothing shall ever grow again. <laughs> <laughs> I call those my little UFO circles where I spread that that compost I brought in. But so uh, Hugo culture. So if, uh, I guess, again, people uh, can refer to your materials. I don't want to uh, try and recreate the whole thing here. But the idea is you would gather logs, branches, hopefully still with bark in there, maybe for some extra nutrients. You pile whatever soil you've got on top of that. And uh, over time, I, uh, question one, do you do you arrange those north south or do you do east west so you get little valleys with with shade and brighter sun and two um do they do they collapse over time okay uh number one um uh i prefer to make hugo cultures go in all kinds of squirrely wiggly directions okay be be an artist make it <laughs> all go and right. all kinds of wonky make them curvy don't make them straight lines uh the mighty the glorious the amazing Zepp holzer originally said uh, something about uh, uh, you want to make them be perpendicular to the general direction of the wind. And then when I met him in 2009, I proposed him this idea of wiggly stuff that would fit next to each other so the wind couldn't possibly get in from any direction. And uh, I don't speak any German, and he doesn't speak any English, but he did learn one word to share with me that day, one English word, and that was catastrophe which is what he said for anything i had to say but we got to be good friends anyway um and then when his book comes out what do you see lots of curly stuff <laughs> the straight lines are gone so uh <laughs> i guess he got past that whole catastrophe thing maybe it's the same word in both languages we don't know <laughs> uh i've heard him say it in german and it's catastrophen and oh that's close enough yeah <laughs> good enough i i could so like when he talks about the government he uses the word dumb cop a lot uh -huh. <laughs> I think I've heard of that one. I know that from from Hogan's Heroes, so I got that one. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. There's a there's this great bit where there's this old old uh, VHS movie of him, and and he's uh, he's pointing across the valley to a bunch of conifer trees, and um, and he's pissed. He's he's like angrily shaking his fist and pointing over there. What's going on? And um, and normally throughout the whole thing, then you hear the English translation kind of overdub everything he says. But for some reason, he's going on and on and on. And in German, if you're going to be pissed off, I think that might be the very best language to ever be pissed off. You know, <laughs> and he's just and it just just goes on. It's like, you know, where's the English translation? And finally, there's the English translation and it's. The government doesn't understand. <laughs> it's like, wait, you cut out all the good parts. <laughs> so uh, let's, in this uh, book, um, which, by the way, I'm a Kickstarter for. A lot of people from my site kicked in. In fact, somebody alerted me from my, my community about your Kickstarter there. So in this book, what are people going to find in there? You're going to find uh, a lot of silly um, and there's going to be uh, a lot of practical solutions. There's going to be, I don't know, probably, and, and it's like we, we tried, 
when we started writing the book, the book was just getting crazy massive. Yeah. And it's like, there's no way anybody's going to read a book this big. So what we decided to do was try to provide clues to things, just enough information to get you really tasted up for it without going into the full detail. And we put tons of footnotes throughout the book so people can go and get more information about all the little bits and bobs. But we tried to present it in little, so there's 32 chapters, and each chapter tries to cover uh, a, a particular kind of angle or aspect on on things. And it's about solutions. And we we put a powerful focus on just the solutions. I think there might be two or three in there that will cost money or will be uh, less than luxuriant. But most of them that we put in there are like we only wanted stuff that would save you money and make your life more luxuriant. And if you don't mind, I'll give you a quickie example, which yes, I please. suspect you've probably talked about. Have you talked about going poolless? Mm-hmm. Yep, it's been mentioned. Let's go there. Okay, all right, all right. So here's a simple thing everybody can do. Try going a week without soap or shampoo in the shower. And, and if the thing is, is what you might find is that the, at the end of the week that your hair is far more luxuriant than it has ever been. Um, and on top of that, like if you say, oh, well, then I'm going to stop buying this toxic gick and rubbing it all over myself uh, in the shower, you'll find that, okay, so you're saving money because you're not buying that stuff anymore. Uh, you're healthier because you're not rubbing toxic gick all over yourself anymore. Um, and on top of that, your shower time, the average American shower time is seven and a half minutes. But when you're poolless, you'll find that your average shower time is a minute and a half. And this is the number one place that you use hot water. And so your hot water bill will drop dramatically from going poolless. And so this is something where your life is more luxuriant and you're saving money. And you're lowering your energy footprint and lowering your toxic footprint, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's an example of a simple thing, and all it takes is a little bit of knowledge, and suddenly the world is changing before your very eyes. And, and if we did, if, if collectively, if, if uh, in all of these chapters, people found things to do, um, so uh, here are a couple of complaints. People often say, hey, I can't afford to do all of these things. So they, they sound expensive because often, you know, in a consumer culture, guess what? You want to do something, it costs money, right? So, you know, oh, I need solar, tons of money. I need um, a, a Tesla, tons of money. So these are all ways to sort of purchase your way towards happiness. Of course, in many cases, those are actually counterproductive if you peel them back far enough. So it, it are these things that you could imagine that that mythical median and below household doing that we were just talking about? Oh, yeah. Oh, easy, easy. I've got all kinds of, hey, we talked about heat earlier, right? Mm-hmm. You know, and, and speaking of like what, you know, people going and buying their way into environmentalism, uh, what's the number one thing that people think that they're doing that's helping the environment where they go out and they spend like five to 20 bucks? I don't know. What would that be? Light bulbs. Oh, yeah, the light bulbs. Well, Al Gore said to do that, so... Yeah, Al. He, Al! He, we gotta have a chat, Al. Me and well, you. he was we too busy talk. on one of his three private jets going to one of his other four homes, so he couldn't well, have that conversation. You know what? And that's another thing, too, is I want people to do all the traveling they want to do. I want people to do all... I want them... I mean, there's a whole big thing about should you order pizza because of all the environmental footprint of having pizza delivered. I want people to to have all the pizza they want, and I want them to do all the things. If Al Gore wants to tool around in his jet, I want to make a world where he has fun doing that. And it's like at the same time, I want to solve all the problems, and I think we can do that. So, But let's go back to the light bulb thing for just a moment. First of all, pretty much everything everybody – if you're in a cold climate – then pretty much everything you've been told isn't going to work the way you think. And, um, uh, and I want to point out that we talked earlier, 60, 63%, I just want to I'm skipity, skip, 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 63% of the uh, cold climate Americans' energy consumption, energy bill, is for heat. And so that's the place to start, really. Light bulb stuff, 4%. And it's like, so 63% versus 4%. Now, here's, here's the amazing thing, is that I want to, first I want to talk to people about how to use light bulb stuff properly, as opposed to like, let's put 20 light bulbs in the ceiling 20 feet above us. 
Hmm. And it's like, how about if we move those light bulbs way closer and we only need one or two rather than a whole bunch? But here, here is a thing. Here's, a, here's an engineering fact. Let's suppose that it's January and you live in Montana and you got baseboard heaters. And um, you're going to have a, an electric heat bill that month of $200. I just made the number up. Um, right. But then uh, what you did was is um, you turned on all the lights. So you did, you know, one January, January of um, uh, 2018. Then you uh, lived a normal life with your electric heat and it was $200. And let's say that the weather and all the conditions and everything were exactly the same in January of 2019. Only you turned on all the lights in the house and you just left them on 24 seven. What is your heat bill, your electric heat bill, or your electric, your 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 electric bill? Let's say it's, say your electric bill was two hundred dollars in two thousand eighteen, January two thousand eighteen, and two thousand nineteen. I'm just going to proclaim exactly the same, hmm. and that's because um, now all of those incandescent lights, because I'm saying that they're incandescent. I'm sorry, I kind of threw that in a little late. All those incandescent light bulbs are thrown off heat. But whatever like kind of light bulbs you were using, those are also throwing off heat. They are, and so basically now, with all the light bulbs in the house on, your thermostat isn't coming on as often. So the baseboard heat isn't run as often. So that's something to keep in mind. Now, let's do this magical, mysterious thing. Let's, let's bring the lights closer to the human beings. If there's a couch, mount the light bulbs close over the heads of the human beings. Um, and then if it's going to be a desk, let's move a single light bulb close over the head of the single human being that's at that single desk. Um, for wherever there's going to be people, let's, let's do smart lighting, and it's all incandescent. Now what happens is, is that whenever it happens to be dark outside, you know, like in January, people are turning on the lights. And then what happens is you've got the thermostat set to a comfortable 72 degrees, and then somebody says, it's too warm in here because they got that light so close to them. It's heating them with, and a, with a form of heat that's far more efficient than the type of heat that you're going to get out of a baseboard heater, radiant heat. Radiant heat is far more efficient than convective heat. And so now you're getting this extremely efficient light. So then you go, and first of all, whenever you're not in a room, all you got to do is turn off the lights when you're not in that room. But, you know, under this scenario, you could leave them on. But I'm going to say, I want to make a scenario that's even more efficient. So you're turning off the lights in a room that you're not in. And the thermostat for the whole house is controlled in one location. And next thing you know, it's set to something like 64. Because wherever the lights are on and whenever you're there, you're getting, you're getting drowned in this very efficient form of radiant heat that's warming up the people instead of the whole house. The whole house has been dropped down to 64, but you still feel just as comfortable as if it was 72. Now your heat bill has dropped to possibly 40% less. You're saving far more money than if you switch to LED bulbs. Ta-da! Well, How's that? I, I, you you just... were making a presentation of like how to save money. Well, that's right? a that's a great way to start because uh, oftentimes if you're saving money, you're doing something that's more energetically efficient. Quite often in business, that's true. So this is something we cover in the book a fair bit, mm -hmm. a little bit. It's just like I think it's just part of one chapter, really. But uh, the, the the incandescent bulb has been demonized. You're you're upending uh, fifteen right? years of of uh, programming. <laughs> yeah, I wonder why it's been demonized. You know. Uh, I've got a video up on uh, YouTube. I put up there, I don't know, like eight years ago called Mr. Stinky Pants. <laughs> All right. And, and it's basically talk, it, it talks a little bit about the invention of the incandescent light bulb. And um, uh, then it talks about the Phoebus cartel. Have you talked about the Phoebus cartel on your show? No. So the Phoebus cartel is where all the light bulb manufacturers got together and said, you know what? If we shorten the lifespan of our bulbs, all of us, and we all say an incandescent can't last more than 1,000 hours, then we'll sell more light bulbs. So that's what they did. They all agreed to that. And they had penalties between organizations that if you make one that lasts longer, we will penalize you. 
Now, keep in mind, uh, I'm sure you've heard of the Centennial Bulb. Yes, yeah, that, that awkward bulb that's still burning somewhere, Brooklyn, I don't know where. <laughs> it's, it's been going for, I believe, like 120 years now. And it's an incandescent bulb. Incandescent bulbs can be made to last an extremely long time. But we've artificially shortened their lifespan so that way the light bulb companies could make more money. Now, what would happen if um, a CFL actually cost $20 to get it here? and stuff? Because, I mean, like right now you can get an energy audit. And when they do an energy audit, do they not bring by a ton of CFL bulbs? Sure they do. Like, They're throwing them at you. Yeah, and they're sticking them in closets, and they're like, they're, they're free, right? And, and do you really believe, like, people from China sent you love and kisses, like, you know, <laughs> oh, we, we love you so much, you know, uh, uh, here we're delivering, them, we're delivering them to you personally, and, and uh, uh, we'll install them. No, they're not doing that. No. So uh, um, somebody, the reason why is because somebody's getting rich. Now, I believe, and I could be wrong, but I've done a little research, and I think I am right. And that is that I believe that with the CFLs, they got like 40 to maybe 100 different subsidies from different branches of government to the point that they were getting like maybe um, 40 to $50 per light bulb. And, um, and they're paying something like $12 per bulb to get them to our shores. So they're making bank. And now they're just taking that same recipe and moving it over to LED. Now the LED has got, there's some other stories there. There's a lot of other stuff happening, but basically it's the same companies, but you'll notice that when you get that energy audit, it's still the CFLs and not the LED bulbs. And it's kind of like, why don't they bring you a, a, a clothesline? I mean, a clothesline would save you far more money per year. In fact, if, Changing your light bulbs out makes really any significant difference to your power bill. Then, um, really, I think we need to talk about you know how you got too many lights on or something. I mean, it's like I, I don't know how many times I've seen people with um, really bizarre lighting habits. Like um, uh, in the book, I talk about the lonely boat. Somebody's got. Uh, I used to live in a place where there was a neighbor. He had a boat and its own little garage, and it had this uh, single CFL burning twenty four seven. Uh, 365 days a year just to keep the boat company. And so it's, it's like, okay, so there's an example of energy being wasted. I also talk about a scenario where somebody had a, a porch that had like a whole bunch of those little tiny incandescent uh, fancy bulbs. And so I calculated that it used 720 watts, whereas a single floodlight at 350 watts appeared to be about 10 times brighter than all of those fancy bulbs. And that's and, and so there's a lot of truth to that. There's the, the thing is, if you have one bulb, it puts out more light than two bulbs that have half the wattage. And so, you know, when it comes to smart lighting, we should be talking about that kind of stuff. But the bottom line is, is that with the CFL, the light bulb manufacturer has a huge profit per bulb. But for the incandescent, they don't. So when the incandescent light bulbs got banned, who were the lobbyists? It was the manufacturers of light bulbs. It makes sense. And uh, that brings us to this idea of a gap between what should happen and what will happen. So I live in an area where, where there's still some growth going on. We had some houses parked in an alfalfa field, uh, just an absolute waste of a very nice piece of soil. And uh, these houses were plunked in direct orientation to the road, not south. Uh, their glazing of windows was just willy nilly. It was standard. Looks like something you would find in a brochure. And they were built with two by four stick with, um, as I watched them go up in just fiberglass insulation. Now we know so much more than that, right? Just tip them all in to south direction, use two by six, uh, insulate them well, and the energy savings off of that home will pay for that house over, over the course of its lifetime. And we're still not doing it. So in this story of you've got a lot of things that we can do, um, in, and you've also been at this a while. So in, in the decade, I'll say, or however long you've been at this, it, it's, uh, how's the momentum going? Are, are more people actually gravitating to this? Is it, do you still find yourself swimming upstream uh, against a stream of ignorance? Or wh where do you personally feel we are in this story right now? I think it's a little column A and a little column B. Yeah. There's a lot of swimming upstream, but at the same time, there's a lot more people that are swimming with me. And um, 
at the same time, you mentioned earlier, like Toby Hemingway, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, it's it's like he he certainly made a big dent. Um, and I kind of feel like the recipe isn't to try to appeal to people's sense of like do it for the earth or we're all going to die, because that almost universally falls on deaf ears, or even worse, they don't want to hear about it because they already bought the light bulb, so they're all good. They did their part, mm-hmm. um, which drives me crazy. It's like, no, you made it worse. <laughs> and so uh, I I kind of feel like the thing to do is, is to appeal to their wallet. I mean, you're talking about, um, okay, they built these houses with two-by-fours and crappy insulation and stuff like that, and it's kind of like, uh, uh, all right, so you go and you – you're like, why? Why would you do that? And it's like, because it's 10% cheaper than a house that was built to the specifications that you just outlined. And I think that if we're going to solve these problems, we have to appeal to the checkbook. And a lot of these things, we can. We can totally appeal to the checkbook. But of course, when we do that, when we convey a message that appeals to the checkbook, which now I'm just realizing, do people even use checkbooks anymore? <laughs> <laughs> Whoops, maybe not. <laughs> Appeal to the coin, you know? And I think, I think coin might be a more powerful word today than it was 10 years ago. Um, to appeal to the coin, then uh, it's like, where's the profit motivation in that? Who's profiting off of appeal to the coin? I mean, we just talked about the light bulb manufacturers. They're, you know, they're making more coin if you can part with more coin or if you can buy in to what they tell you. I mean, they put the word eco right on the box, right? Mm. And, and, and they've done it so much that now when we talk about eco, most people believe that those light bulbs are the most eco thing that there is. And so then, and, in fact, they believe it's so good that if they just simply buy the light bulbs, they can be all done. Like, and that solves everything. And when they hear about something like we're all going to die from whatever, then they're like, why don't more people just buy those light bulbs? You know, that's what I did. <laughs> they're so convinced that that's the end story that, you know, and it's like, wow, some, that would, whoever did that marketing did an amazing job. And that's, that's like the ultimate perfect example of greenwashing. But <clears throat> yeah, and you know, I, I watched um, uh, some videos of uh, Sepp Holzer uh, in preparation for this, and and like many people who are um, like your light bulb story, right? There's complexity. As soon as you start really observing something and, and you dig in, you find there are relationships. There's more complexity than you thought. The light bulb to buy a CFL and feel like I'm done is to just have a simplifying aspect to this story. But otherwise, we have to be aware that we're in a complex system. This is a highly complex uh, environment that we're in. It might be as complex as like needing to track all the different possible things that could go wrong if I bring an input. If I dare to bring luxurious brown, good smelling compost onto my property, I might be bringing um, an actual uh, trauma. You know, so it's getting very difficult to to sort of operate in that environment. But we can appeal to the pocketbook. We can appeal to maybe the old guy likes apple blossoms in spring. And that's that's his, whatever the reason is. There are things that people can do that begin to right the ship. And some of those things, uh, I, I like this idea of luxuriant environmentalism, right? I, I live at a very, if you came to my house, half acre, that's why I picked that number, Greenfield, Massachusetts, uh, you will see uh, I've got elderberries growing. I've got all these different pollinator species. It's beautiful, right? And I think people walking by my house would say, oh, that, hey, I hope somebody walks by and says, geez, I'd like to have flowers too, right? I'm planning for very specific reasons, but beauty is one of them. And I feel like a lot of our culture is is um, is militated against thinking about things in terms of longevity, in terms of next generation, in terms of long term, in terms of beauty itself. So and guess what? Young people say, I have no meaning and purpose. I don't get the story. I've lost the plot line. Right. And and there's many flavors of beauty. And a lot of people argue against permaculture because they believe it uh, looks too rough or too wild. Hmm. Um, and I think that it has its own beauty. And um, uh, that's a that's a whole other path to appreciate when it's done when it's done well. It, it it can be done as well as your typical landscaping. I, I kind of feel like a lot of landscaping is uh, people putting their their boot on the throat of Mother Nature and instead of like trying to develop a romantic relationship with Mother Nature. 
Well, I, I, I planted elderberries because yeah, they're, they're great medicine, but I have a lot of jewelweed growing natively. So I said, oh, wet feet. I can know something that likes wet feet and I want it, you know, so that's as, that's as complex as I've gotten with it. Um, but just notice what's already growing and probably other things can be encouraged. And that's what I love about the permaculture idea is that we can use our brains for all kinds of things. But one thing we can do is we can speed up Mother Nature's already robust processes by applying uh, a little bit of thought and effort. So that's the part I love. I love being a part of that dance rather than against it. Here, here's a good one. A lot of a lot of your listeners are legally required to grow a lawn, and for whatever reason, they've decided they're going to do it. And and it's like, so uh, let let's see if what I can do, if I can say some magic words, and it will cut it'll it'll save them like a hundred dollars per year, and save them maybe four or five hours a year. Um, and they can have the most magnificent looking lawn on their block. And, and really, 90% of this is covered in two words, which 90% of your listeners still won't believe me when I say it, no matter what. And that is mow high. Hmm. All you got to do is set your lawnmower as high as it'll go. It'll solve 90% of all of your lawn mowing needs. You won't have to irrigate as often. You can eliminate the need for your weed and feed. There's a long, long list of, of benefits from mowing high. And people errantly believe if they mow low, it'll be longer until they have to mow again. But actually, if you mow high, it'll be longer until they have to mow again. And the reason is, is that when you mow low, then the grass plant itself needs to do the photosynthesis dance. And so it has to grow blades of grass really, really, really fast. And then so then it comes out uneven again, and now you got to mow it again. Whereas as long as it looks like it's got a, a crew cut, it's fine. So when you <laughs> mow high, then the grass plant focuses on making more grass plants, not with – because, like, these, these photosynthesis harvesters are working good. You know, when they're four inches tall or three inches tall, something like that, working good. And we don't need to panic and grow a bunch more of those really fast. So you get to kind of – keep that crew cut look where everything's mowed at the same height it stays that way longer and it puts out more plants that's making your turf even thicker and it looks even better and better and better wow great one as we uh come into the closing parts of this i have uh, of course uh, important question which is uh, for all the millennials gen x's uh, the younger generation people out there who got locked out thanks to central bank policy that turned them into renters uh, they feel like they don't have a, a place to call their own what's what's what are the things that uh they can begin doing maybe even what's in your book about uh, for people who feel dispossessed as it were in this story oh that that is I've got so much to say. Um, well, three is it words. okay if I talk about PEP? <laughs> sure. You've heard, okay, so with, with, with PEP, the, the thing is, the thing that I was experiencing, in fact, I just had somebody here. We had the, uh, the, the PDC and ATC here recently, and there was a woman who was talking about, like, well, I want to be part of community, but I can't afford buying the land mm -hmm. and getting it started. And so then I said, well, <clears throat> have you con considered PEP? And so... Basically, the, the, the core of PEP is that there are these old people all over America, millions of them, sitting on 200 acres or more. And oftentimes they have two houses on the property. They've got a damn fine truck and a damn fine tractor, and they got like 90 to 100 grand in the bank. And they want to will it to somebody, but they just need to have somebody worthy to will it to. And so we're trying to set up a program that's totally free so that way you can build the experiences that would impress such a person into willing their life. And you might think, like, no one's going to do that. And I was like, oh, yeah, they will. They hate their kids because their kids are going to just um, uh, uh, sell the land and pocket the money. But they're kind of like, I put my life into this land. I want to see it continue on into the future being something farm-esque. And, and it's like, I don't want to, I don't want my kids to get it and just liquidate it. I want to see it move forward after I'm gone. And so they're, they're desperate. They so desperately want to find somebody. So you're talking about somebody like, let's say they're 18 years old and they're contemplating going into college. And now I think, I don't think we even have, do we even have colleges anymore? I think they call them all universities. 
It's like somehow we've become embarrassed about the word college. But anyway, <laughs> the thing is, is it's like how much debt do you take on to go to a public school these days? Is it eighty grand? I heard it's crazy that it's like ten or twenty times more than when I went to college. Yep. And so basically, they want to saddle you with eighty grand worth of debt, and then you're stuck in the rat race. And then when you finally, and it takes 23 years on average to pay off your student loan. I thanks Google for that one. Uh, that one, that's amazing. 23 years. So uh, by the time when you're 18 and you decide to, to go into into college, then your commitment is greater than your lifespan to date. <laughs> <laughs> And it's kind of like, all right, so then what happened? And it's like when you, when you graduate, it turns out that you picked the wrong degree and no one wants to hire you, uh, unless you got an MBA. <laughs> but that's six years of school. That's a little bit bigger ticket, too. <clears throat> but, it, but also an MBA, that's boring, man. That's so, oh, that's hard. You got to stay awake in those classes. <laughs> but maybe some people are like grooving. Them. I don't know. Anyway, the, the, the key is, is it's like, all right, you you did your eight. You're 18 years old. You added 23 years to that. Now uh, you got to finish paying off your house and your car and all these other debts you've accumulated. Maybe you got another 10 years on that. So what does that make? If you add that all up, 20 and 20 is 40. Is 50 or 50 some years old? Now, like you start looking at retirement, and what are you going to do when you retire? And so it's like maybe what you want to what you want to do is to get 200 acres with a house or two on it. Etc. and retire and futz in your garden. And it's like, uh, how about a shortcut? How about if you skip all that other stuff, you get PEPFOR certified, uh, it takes three years, and, and then you inherit land, complete with the trucks and the tractor and the whatever else, and, and a bit of coin, and, uh, and you go right into the permaculture lifestyle. So Basically, you get to do what Chris is doing on his half an acre, but you've got something closer to 200 acres. And uh, that sounds fantastic. What is the PEP? What's that stand for? Permaculture experience, according to Paul. That would be me. <laughs> now, I've set it up so that, you know, there's, there's 25 other letters in the alphabet. So, uh -huh. they, so it's, we call it the PEX program, and different people can set up their standards for what they think is good, because mine's going to be cold climate stuff. Mm-hmm. But um, this is something that uh, I came up with the idea like four years ago, and we've been fleshing it out. And um, now there's a whole bunch of people that are getting certified um, for some of the smaller things and working their way up. Um, so we're just getting started in this. But when you're saying, what do I advise to young people, it's this. Um, I, I think, and it's free. It costs nothing. Um, you go ahead and get those experiences however you're able and then post a picture of like, you know, before, during and after here I am getting this experience and I uh, get certified for those experiences and they add up. And then once you get enough, you're PEP4 certified. Fantastic. And, and uh, a lot of people are looking for they want the community and the old people have the capital, whatever form that's in. But, uh, you know, it's it's not about just that anymore. People want to be able to be part of something and get that sense of meaning and purpose uh -huh. and yeah. belong. Yeah, that might be what you were asking, but I, I went in a different direction. <laughs> no, that's fine, too. I, I, but, but you're right. In the book, I talk about and, and granted, I only give one chapter of this because this this is worthy of a library of books. Um, how do you get 20 people to live under one roof without stabbing each other? And and it's kind of like, no, it's, it's true. For all of the problems that we have, one of the very best solutions is going to be uh, uh, community, community living, sharing a kitchen, living under one roof. And uh, the thing is, is the upsides are that you can live in a far more luxuriant environment for one-third the cost. But it comes with a massive downside, which for all of those listening to this right now who uh, in college shared a house with buddies or something, um, some of those worked out, just a few. Mm -hmm. Most of those didn't work out, and there's a reason why People tend to live in an apartment by themselves or with their family or in a house with just their family and not with 20 other people. And it's because of the drama. 
it's it's death by a thousand little dramas. And it's like after a while, you just can't stomach it anymore. Because like right now, if you wanted to go into your neighborhood and rent a room in a nice house, uh, it would probably be roughly one third the cost of whatever you're living in right now. Accurate? Yeah, roughly. And you don't do it because of the drama. Yep. Yep. I mean, <laughs> so it's kind of like, all right, all right. So I am putting an enormous amount of work into trying to solve the drama stuff. And, uh, and it's, a, it's a big, tall order. Uh, I'm, I'm working on a book on it. Um, and, the, and basically the book's going to say this is not the book. It's, it's a book talking about trying to get to the book. And and it's going to be because I I think this is going to take me another ten years to get sorted out to even something that just works, you know, um, some of the time. Well, good I mean, luck. Right you're, now you've got a moving target that you're trying to hit because the the boomer generation you're talking about that's currently retiring is so different from the people who are raised on smartphones and uh, with a very different uh, or, orientation. Every generation varies anyway, but. The, the social graces, niceties, abilities, and community requires real skills. You know, it, it's it's inner work. It's owning your own stuff. It's understanding how to, to negotiate and be part of something. Uh, that's, that's a moving target in this culture right now. Oh, absolutely. And so I kind of feel like what, what happens if you have a friend who is happy and everything is going great for your friend and everything sucks for you? And you're going to, you're going to ask your friend, like, what are you doing? What, what's so special? I mean, isn't that somewhat motivating? And I, I think that that's where it all begins. And so like, for example, here at my place, we offer the, um, the permaculture boot camp, And it's like, so we call it the permaculture boot camp for a very specific reason. I mean, how many of your millennials, or I'm not even sure what to call the people that are 18. How many How many 18-year-olds? How about if we call them that, 18-year-olds? I think they're calling them Gen Z because it's the last one. I'm not positive on that, though. That's just a theory. Oh, my God. We're all going to stop breeding? <laughs> I guess. You know, unless we get this right. <laughs> so, uh, um, so how many 18-year-olds are going to sign up for something called a boot camp? And, it, and it's like, you know, like our, our motto is you're going to learn permaculture through a little hard work. And uh, they work you know, 40 hours a week. Um, but so the, the, the cool thing is, is that the people that show up now for this um, are quite industrious and, and they're willing to put the work. In fact, they, they probably do an extra 10 or 15 hours a week on top of the 40 hours a week of uh, their own projects and stuff. And so it's kind of like it appeals to a different set. And you're right, when you're when you are living in a household and you hate your parents and so you're leaving that and you go out into the big world and the big world kind of seems to hate you too. I mean, my understanding is that the suicide rate is extremely high right now. Is that accurate? It is. It's uh, all time, all time records right now. Yeah. And so I think there might be a connection in here somewhere. Um, and, and I, I kind of feel like there's, I don't know, a hundred hours of things to talk about, about our, our modern society in this way. But, but I'm, I'm, I kind of don't want to, what I, what I really want to talk about are how do we make things better? And I kind of feel like if somebody's like, yeah, I've got my own house that I built myself and I grow all my own food. And, um, so when you start talking about, uh, uh, president fleet Florp, um, I don't know who that is. And I, it doesn't really affect me. I mean, I kind of feel like there's a lot to be said for that. Well, what did you do? And it's like, well, I kind of got involved in permaculture. And next thing you know, I've built my own house. And I've, I now grow so much food that um, I can't possibly eat it myself. And so I'm traveling this path. And uh, I spend my days basically retired. And I'm 25. You know, it's like... I don't know. That's kind of a sweet-sounding package, isn't it? Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. And uh, a lot of people are, are obviously turning away from uh, here, here's the thing about a culture like ours and our, our, you know, to get back to the to that side of things for a second is that once you begin to question it, you can find a lot of flaws in it. You know, oh, my gosh, look what we're doing to ourselves with our sick care system or our food or whatever those things are. And you can say, I don't want any of that. But, you know, saying not this is insufficient. You also have to say, well, then what am I? Uh, moving towards people have been adrift on that and that's what i I like about um the solutions that you're offering because there's a way for people to get involved and i love this quote i was watching a ted talk on addiction and the guy said the opposite of addiction isn't sobriety it's connection right and that's really what what permaculture to me represents is connection it's sitting down and trying to puzzle out what is going on here and is there any way for me to participate in this dance that's already going on and um you know work with it and so I, I like that idea. And I think that's what a lot of young people are beginning to gravitate towards this idea of like, I want to belong to something that's tangible, meaningful, and has beauty and has some other aesthetics in it besides, does this only make money? Um, you know, can I figure out a better way to make a light bulb last for a, a predetermined short amount of time? Hey, that's for some people, not for everybody. So who am, who am I and what's my thing? Yeah. Absolutely. Have you read my stuff about gertitude, the whole bird and gert thing? No. So a lot of people are talking about how do I make a million dollars with permaculture? And I can spell it out. Uh, you know, and I've got, I've got a bunch of podcasts about that. Mm-hmm. I've got presentations I've done about that. But really the thing is what we call, uh, what we now call gertitude. And, and so I try to tell the story of Ferd and Gert. Ferd works a job. He's getting paid so much money per year. And um, he gets his food by going to restaurants and going to the grocery store, et cetera. Gert has achieved the permaculture dream, and uh, she's basically retired. And uh, but she does once a year or throughout throughout the, the the fall, basically she she does put a little more effort on her food systems because she's trying to preserve it and and get it and, and put it up so that she can have food to eat through the winter. Um. Uh, but the thing is, is that Gert, uh, earns very little money compared to Ferd. So, uh, Gert is, uh, she makes, couple, she makes some money because she grows an excess of food and some people buy that food. She does a couple of other little things. Um, I mean, basically it's kind of tied in, well, mm, ah, so many things to say, but let's just say Gert is the same age as Ferd but she's effectively retired and, and she's living the permaculture dream. She's got her own little house. She's got her garden and uh, she's, she lives in a community. There's a bunch of other, other Gert like plots around her. And uh, this is, this is the people that she hangs out with and she does stuff with. And, and of course, Gert's got her special thing that she does and that, that, you know, makes it so that she's got uh, she does a little bit of consulting here and there and she does helping people with some designs of this and that and and that's her thing and that's what defines her but for the most part she's self-sufficient she owns a pickup truck but she finds that she only goes into town like once every three months for a little change of scenery she can go into town as often as she wants she just doesn't feel like it this is the story of her I mean there's a lot more to it and it's in the book but um, it's in the book about financial strategies. And next to it, we, we, not only do we talk about early retirement extreme, uh, the, all the material written by Jacob Ludden Fisker, but, but Jacob went through the chapter with us. We also talk about Rob Roy's uh, works on mortgage-free, um, and we talk about um, uh, passive income streams and kind of mixing all those together. Fantastic. Uh, that's, those are topics we cover quite a bit, um, looking at uh, the FIRE movement and how people go about that. You know, the pros and cons, you, it's it's not all panacea, but the idea that um, the an unexamined spending lifestyle is one that's very easy to fall into. And if you just cut back and, and do it thoughtfully and set some goals up, it can become a very different experience for people. Um, so uh, I feel terrible for all the young people who got sold into the idea that you go out of high school and you go into 100000 in debt and you have yourself a, a nice liberal arts degree from somewhere. Um, it's not a path to anything anymore. And shame on the counselors who said it was because it hasn't it's been for a while. We can, you know? can we call it slavery? Is that okay? It's okay. Yeah, we do that. Yeah, okay. We, we do that, you know. But it's, you know, uh, it's one step removed. Your past choices. Yeah. 
Well, uh, when you think about how the debt is created in the system and that no work was involved in creating debt, um, the banks just, you know, click a few keys on a keyboard. But now your output is now tied to that for 23 years. Uh, that's I can't imagine what other word besides slavery actually applies uh, in that ex particular example. Um, so it's, it's just slavery it, with extra steps. Yeah, one one step removed. That's all it takes for humans. We're not very complicated. You know, the PG&E engineers are like, well, I put the water down into the water table. I didn't pour hexavalent chromium on the kid's cereal. Cut me a slag, you know. So, you know, it's just how it works. It's one step removed. That's all it takes. So, uh, gosh, we've taken up so much of your time. And, and I, obviously, we feels like we could go for a lot longer and still barely scratch the surface. So I know, Paul, that you have a, a lot of this material on your websites, which I mentioned. But please, uh, help people locate all all of your uh, fine work that's out there to be found. Where would they go? I'd say I'd say if you're going to go to one place, it's permies.com. Uh, it, it has uh, most of the stuff is going out to the forums uh, where we've, I mean, forums are pretty much done with today, but um, ours is still growing. And I think it's because we have a different way of doing communication there than most forums do. Um, and, uh, but that'll get you, you know, lined up for the, the, DVDs about uh, rocket mass heaters, as well as uh, the world domination gardening DVDs, which is basically you know the kinds of earthworks that you might do to do mm -hmm. gardening. Um, we've got a new DVD out now about rocket ovens, um, and uh, when Christmas time rolls around, then boy, we sure sell a lot of those permaculture playing cards. Mm -hmm. So um, that's those are the products, but mostly there's free, free, free stuff all over in the forums, and I think that you'll find. We, we focus on what we call perennial discussion. So there's a, a lot of discussion there that's been going on for 10 years where you can jump in at any time. Well, fantastic. So people, please follow uh, those links. We're going to have them here, at, of course, at the bottom of the podcast, like we always do. Read and digest as much as you need to take action because it's time to take action. Uh, we're almost out of time in this story. If you look at some of the measures I'm looking at, everything hinges on you doing everything you can in your own backyard, in your community, in your neighborhood. This is Chris Martinson signing off. Paul, thank you so much for your time and your expertise today. Very generous. Thank you, Chris. All right, everyone. May you create abundance and prosper.